If there's one thing I lament about the decline of physical media, it's the fact that we hardly get any decent special features anymore. And that's why I've been rounding up people that worked on Batman the Animated Series to provide commentary tracks for some of my favourite episodes. This time I've brought in director Kevin Altieri and storyboard artist Brad Rader to talk about their episode, The Clock King. If you've never watched one of my commentary videos before, simply play this video while watching your copy of the episode and it should sync up quite nicely. If you don't have the episode to hand, don't worry, you can still listen to this as if it were a podcast. I kept the recording going after the episode ended and we have about 45 minutes of additional discussion about their influences, the making of the show and Batman the Animated Series' legacy. In fact, it probably would have gone on longer if Zoom hadn't stopped recognising my microphone. Anyway, it's time to bring up your copy of the show, so get ready to press play in 3, 2, 1, now. Hello and welcome to another Batman the Animated Series commentary track video. I'm joined today by Brad Rader. Hello Brad. Hi. And I'm also joined by Kevin Altieri. Hello. <laughs> Glad to be back. Yeah, I'm I'm delighted to have you back, Kevin, and you, Brad, as well. It's been too long. Um, so we're watching The Clock King today. Um, Yay. Brad, what was your involvement in this episode? I storyboarded Act 3 and part of Act 1. Yeah. It's, it's like in... Yeah, well, I was the director on this, but I was also heavily doing storyboards because it was me, Mike Gogan, Brad, and always that extra guy that doesn't get it, you know. So there was a lot of time that I had to spend, you know, trying to coach someone into uh, doing a good board until finally I just ended up yanking it away and doing it myself. <laughs> Especially since... Especially since in this episode, it's it's actually I love the concept. Um, this Clock King I thought was brilliant. You know, it's a great character, and I love this opening. I uh, I designed all those characters and it's right. little people standing around. Yeah, no, it's a typical of this. It's like I had to grab uh, Brad and drop him in places where he was only supposed to be doing a whole act himself you know and like i i ended up drawing a lot of this myself well i thought you storyboarded i my memory in looking at the storyboards is you did the entire um the origin of clock king sequence that was all you uh yeah i think so i ended up doing it oh okay Oh, so that's like, like I, was I designed. Like wondering... I designed that clock. By the way, <laughs> this guy has like so much time on his mind. And another thing I loved about this script was that we finally get Mayor Hill to actually have more of a story. You know, more involvement, like this in Harlequinade. And I love this. I love this setup. And I really enjoy Temple Fugit. I love his. Acting. I think. I think it's interesting that you have Hill's whole monologue over his shoulder, looking at Fugit, and just mm -hmm. how Fugit's reacting. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. <gasps> Gasp! <laughs> See, you could tell that really was my drawing. <laughs> All of. <laughs> Whap. <laughs> no, one of the things that, like, I was thinking about when, uh, you know, we were looking this over again after all these years is that you cherry picked the origin of Tempest Fugit because you usually <laughs> cherry pick the action sequences, but now I understand. Yeah. It wasn't and look by at what choice, a prick it was by this dire guy necessity. Is. <laughs> Sorry, Brad. Look what a prick this guy is. So when he turns into a villain, you have to establish that he's not that nice a guy. You know, he has his obsessions. <gasps> Again, gasp. <laughs> and this is where everything, I think this is, I, th I believe this is Mike Gogan. It was certainly, I mean, it was either Mike or a combination of me and Mike, I think. No, that's me. That's right throw the little bird in to uh, keep the scene alive. Uh. <laughs> and now it all goes wrong. 
the thing I love about this scene is it's just it's a series of unfortunate events, but in his mind, it can't possibly be random. It has to be like some orchestrated campaign against him. It's yeah. so insightful into his character's mindset. Yeah, well, he can't do anything wrong. <laughs> Twenty million. Oh well. <laughs> no, that's you. Except that the inside of his throat, this is another thing about working with animation studios. I knew that uh, Sunrise couldn't get it. Um, for instance, when you see the Clock King, the model that went out was actually the black outfit that the Clock King eventually has in the next episode that he's in. Um, but because it was sunrise, there was always that fallback, like the inside of his throat in that last shot was supposed to be black. There was a model that existed somewhere where it was colored red. And then we said, oh, no, no, change that. Oh, the brown suit's kind of cool. Oh, look, yes. That was Karen, uh, <laughs> our production assistant. Her cat was sick, so the cat turned out to be okay. So we throw in a little... Uh, Easter egg for uh, uh, there. <laughs> That's great. It's that a was... mortal cat now. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, this is this was all me. But then and then just to finish that sunrise grabbed the model that they wanted. Like they grabbed the brown suit. They grabbed the inside of his throat being red. And there was and and there was there was just so many retakes when it came back that there was just so many that you had to let go, you know, because I, this, the show has to go, the show must go on. And this is how you do crowds in animation with a studio that can't animate crowds. <laughs> Nobody moves. <laughs> But, uh, Just keep getting engrossed. Yeah, well, it, it's a really good script. You think something really bad's going to happen? <laughs> the music cue is great. Yeah. yeah. And this is one of the more fun uh, musical yeah, music tracks that we had, too. Ta -da. goes through the car, picks up a package. What could it be? Hmm. A costume, perhaps? <laughs> yeah, we were speaking about that shot just before the call. Yeah. As a direct homage to the Fleischers, right? Yeah. Because the Fleischers, I just loved when they would... Uh... Yeah, this is all Brad. You're right, Brad. I remember now. Well, this, the other thing that struck me about it, it's almost like a mirror, a sequence to the um, Night of the Ninja or Day of the Samurai, where you yeah. like, Robin confront the, the villain on the roof. It's like very much the same. Yeah. And in hindsight, you know, I, I actually am kind of glad that they stuck with the brown suit. Because it, it makes how innocuous he looks. The guy is so capable. I mean, just by uh, mastering his timing and understanding other people's timing, it's a pretty unique power. Because he's not, there's nothing unusual about him as a human being, but he obviously has got acrobatics and stuff down. He kind of has the same uh, abilities as uh, Batman. You know, I mean, uh, you know, like minor acrobatics and things like that. He's not muscular. 
<laughs> well, it's sort of like he does it. He's like <laughs> really um and that rap was actually yeah. So he intellectual intellectual intellectualizes his way through all of his uh you know feats. Yeah. And I, I'm really glad that um the thing about this one too was we kind of bring back the detective Batman figuring things out, which not enough episodes really had him do. No, I think the only other time we saw him wear these goggles was in uh, on leather wings, wasn't it? I believe so. It's kind of like why I wanted to bring him back. Uh, and like seeds like this, they're very simple, you know, and they're staged very simple um simply but it really needs better animation in my opinion you know mm. it's the simple stuff that you really need some zing to the animation like the reference to non brave ogle yeah yep <laughs> And yes, and the difference is that this one, you see, it's like it does take place. You'll notice like the time on the wall is eight. Originally, I thought that this was going to be at night. You know, time is the big thing here, you know, of course. So it ended up not, you couldn't do it at night. Ah, yes, Toth Street. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and again, here he is. He's, you know, detectivating, <laughs> detectivizing. And I love the fact that um, Alfred is his partner in figuring things out, you know. And I love the fact that they said that together. I just like the image of Batman sitting around in the back of his, his car being driven around by Alfred <laughs> during the day. <laughs> well, he kind of needs help figuring things out. And the thing is, they never go back to the Batcave. They just continue on. Um, Was it that way in the script? I, not really. I remember I just did that to just cut down on the amount of locations and stuff. And the fact is, if he shows up with the Batmobile, he'll have a whole ton of crap that would never get him into this situation. You know, it just seems more natural that he could be trapped just having the limo, you know. Just kind of a reasoning that I had in my head. Yep. Mm. Foiled. Yeah, it's great. Like you were saying, Brad, he's intellectualized all the possible things Batman could do, and he's worked out the sequence of events that it's likely to happen in. It's yeah. great. And the thing is, is like how rotten he is. You know? Because he just... Uh, Temple Fugit, he knows that uh, he's going to have to deal with Batman. But he forgot that he had a cassette tape. Well, that's <laughs> got to be the strongest cassette tape ever designed by man. That's what I said. And as, as we're doing it, and I'm reading the script, and it's like, I remember I had arguments with Marty. Uh, I think he was the story editor on this one. Yep. And I had arguments with Marty. I'm saying, really? Cassette tape? No, it's the most important thing. You got to do it. <laughs> you know? And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Yay. It's funny with the Clock King that his revenge is, is just so like petty you know he's, he's just embarrassing mayor hill <laughs> yeah well he's going to embarrass him first 
and endanger a lot of people's lives. I actually think the James Bond film actually ripped us off, didn't they? Which one? I didn't see it. Well, you'll see it when the when the train crash happens in a little bit. Hmm. And this, I again, I had the arguments. You know, it's like trying to get them out, and I figured uh, just like take sandbags of money, you know. <laughs> Here, this is this is what I'm talking about. You remember uh, <laughs> the Daniel Craig uh, ba um, James Bond film with the train crash? I think they ripped us off, man. It's entirely possible. <laughs> Not really, no. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Well, you never know. <laughs> and again. This script was full of crowds, and this is kind of how you handle it. That's really irresponsible of Temple Fugit, isn't it? Well, I guess that's why he's a villain. Yeah. No, that's, a, that's the point, is like how evil the guy is. And he's unrepentant. He grabs the guy. <laughs> no, it's that's supposed to not just come off as mean. Again, the acting and the animation should have been so much better. You know, he's supposed to grab the guy just out of his own desperation. And instead, we have angry Gordon grabbing a guy. Yeah. Kind of a silly situation inside the vault, but it's a cartoon. And quite often what is silly and melodramatic in live action comes across as being, you know, profound in animation. Well, that was the thought anyway. <laughs> We're trying to justify what we did. Yeah, I remember it being thrilling. Yeah, trying to get these guys to draw the clock tower, you know. The background artist that Jade, this is probably the best they've ever done. But it was rough. It was, it was, you could tell it, they had a hard time, you know. <laughs> Fugit. <laughs> and was it Lloyd Bachner pulls this off, you know? Yeah, yeah, the performances this, in this episode are so great. Yeah, and just board-wise, this is kind of uh, Brad's uh, tour de force, I think. One of many. Yeah. Well, no, it's just like, um, yeah, it was it was a lot of fun. Part of the yeah. problem was trying to like time the uh, downward descent of the of the minute hand. Yeah. And choreograph that through the through the sequence. And, uh, yeah, and then, of course, the homage to Miyazaki, Castle Cagliostro. It's just, uh, it was just too perfect for this. And also, it was, uh, part of the thing was, it was a bit of animation that I could actually send to Sunrise to show them, to help them figure out how to make this work. Because this, this, this was a tough one. And they... It really would have been great if TMS could have gotten this episode. All all these moving well, one parts. One of the things that strikes me is those they're on like a turning, a continually yeah. turning thing, and they don't have them like walking sideways to deal with it. 
Yeah, well, like I said, I was looking at the board last night, and they were actually on a walkway. Right. That's what I was going to say. Because that wasn't supposed to be a turning thing, but that's what I got. Because the background guys were too confused by uh, how com- complicated this was. Everyone was complaining about this one, you know. Yeah. Oh, this background's hard. Really? Do we have to use Roman numerals? Oh man. <laughs> you know, so they ended up like substituting the turning thing instead of the walkway. And that, you know. Mm-hmm. Oh, what did you? Yeah, I wonder if Batman really did count how long it took him to do that, if he was just pulling that number out of thin air. Well, I think Batman works more off of instinct, whereas Few gets locked in with time and what he, you know, what he can do with it, whereas Batman just, you know, finally he defeated him just by using his own reflexes. I've always been wow. curious how he survived that. <laughs> it's again, this is that's very classic Batman that we rarely did. Because if you remember, like like the early comics and stuff, there was always like, Do you think the Joker got away? I don't know if he could survive that fall, but only time will tell, you know. And this is like a kind of a classic Batman you know, villain escaping thing. It looks like he got creamed, but did he? It's another one of your episodes that ends with uh, Batman talking to Commissioner Gordon's back. (laughs) Yeah. Well, it's like because Gordon doesn't want the press and everyone to know that, uh, the police force has given him uh, their blessing, you know. Yeah, it's a nice touch. Yeah, it's a, and they, they the when when Batman's just running around and just part of it, but it's like as at this point in the series, he's still a vigilante. He's still working outside the law. So his friendship with uh, Gordon is a true friendship, you know, and and a partnership. So you could kind of. What I liked, what I I liked about David Weiss's script too, is that, again, Alfred, the mayor, Commissioner Gordon, you know, they're kind of they're the partnership between them and Batman is kind of more up front here. It's not just Batman on his own, you know. And in this script, you also see it kind of focuses on. Batman figuring things out, using his brain, being a detective, as well as being, you know, a kind of a force of nature, mm-hmm. if that makes sense. Oh, yeah, absolutely does. Yeah, yeah but this one, <laughs> this one was difficult as the director of it. And, you know, this one was a difficult one. Mm-hmm. You know, thank God I had Brad. Yeah. Well, you also had somebody cleaning my storyboard in Act 3. I'm assuming it was Glenn Murakami. Yeah. And Glenn uh, Glenn was uh, did... He wasn't supposed to be a character designer at this point, but Glenn, you know, Glenn was just a revisionist, but I would use him to do character design because he was such a good character designer. And he could nail the style of the show. So I think a lot of the crowd people... A lot of the background people, you know, like the people just laying down was uh, Glenn. And mm-hmm. if you want to see Glenn's style, that just look at the back that the Colas cat saved on the newspaper. <laughs> yeah. Pure Glenn. That's a pure Glenn drawing. And, and let that and let that be a little bit more cartoony. That that really was his personal style. 
But because it's a photograph within a cartoon, you can let it be a little bit more cartoony in the rest of the show. You know? And, uh, yeah, and I was like, yeah, Karen's cat was... <laughs> Karen's cat was sick and she was really worried about it. And then, you know, and then a couple of days later, it's like, how, how's, how's the cat doing? It's like, Oh, just got him back from the vet and he's doing pretty good. Oh, thank God. You know? So stuck that in there. Didn't even tell her about it. You know, <laughs> I assume she noticed when the episode went out. Yes. <laughs> good. <laughs> and, uh, at that time I had, uh, in the office, I had, uh, a rat that the, a rat named Shmoo that was uh this big old gray rat. Uh I inherited her because uh my ex wife Kathy had like a had it you know a pet rat that she had from uh work at Disney and then they wouldn't let her, you know, have the rat at, at work anymore. <laughs> and so <laughs> I felt so bad for Shmoo that I ended up just carrying her around with me. So she, that, Shmoo did a did a, a cameo. She was the rat that jumps on the onto the windshield and looks in at Alfred in the car. If you see in the there alleyway, yeah, 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 I know exactly the one. Oh, that's, yeah. that's great. <laughs> yeah, and I, I don't know. I think Glenn might have done Glenn or Mike Gogan might have done that character design, but it was based on Shmoo's big butt. <laughs> she was like a classic big old gray rat with a big ass. <laughs> That's getting clipped. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> with a big butt. <laughs> uh, so, Brad, um, as we mentioned earlier, you did a lot of the storyboards on this episode. Do you have any, any recollections of your time from working on it? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well... <laughs> when I asked you about episodes you'd like to talk about, you said, oh, yeah, let's talk about the Clock King. So what well, made I you want to I... talk about Clock King? Um, I don't know. I guess because of the uh, Miyazaki uh, influence. Um, and also, I mean, it reminds me of um, an ALF episode we did, which was basically we ripped off the uh, mountain, mountain car chase from um, Castle Cagliostro 2. Only well, was yeah. Alf's parents like uh, in a Winnebago, are, are in a in, in a, uh, a Melmacky in Winnebago, being harassed by a um, a um, farm a farm machine with giant cartoon hands. <laughs> so that was yeah. uh, you know basically. Um, I mean, I don't know <laughs> that I. I mean, I may have had to go back and like look at look at the um, storyboard. Or the the video for it, but I don't think so. I think I had no. basically internalized it. Yeah, no. At this point, it's like we had a uh, again the the extra artists that ended up not being on the crew very long. I just remember it's like I'm in there talking to you, Brad, and I'm talking to Mike Dogan, and we're having meetings, and it's like, well, you know, we read the script, and we're like, yeah, it's like. This is the only uh, the only option really is to like do Castle Cagliostro, you know. It's just the clock tower. Yeah. It's like we we you know. It's like it's it's clear. It's like the script obviously intended that the script right. it was the script that dictated that we do Castle Cagliostro, right? <laughs> the ending, um, and for me, Brad and Mike, we're just. Yeah, you know, we're just talking about it because we've seen it so many times. We know what we're going to do. Brad's like, yeah, I'm on board for all this. And then I've got this other guy just like, well, how about this? And if we do this and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, just someone like squawking away in my ear. And I'm like, God. <laughs> it's like he doesn't, there was that one person that doesn't even understand what we're talking about. Has no idea, you know. It's like on mm -hmm. my cruise, there always seemed to be that one extra person that just did not get it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. But it's like, yeah, I don't, it wasn't like, you know, I, I mean, I know you didn't, you didn't go and like reference the movie. It's like, it's just that we've already seen it so much and it's so much part of us that, uh, well, there are times when I did reference movies. I mean, yeah, you, you would suggest a movie to reference. And so then I'd go out and rent the movie and watch it. And yeah, sometimes 
freeze frame and sketch off the movie to get camera angles and cutting and stuff. Yeah. I remember when you said I should like on one of the episodes, I think it was um, the Poison Ivy episode where you said, oh, no, this is like reference um, Night of the Demon, which yeah. I had watched um, back in college and kind of sneered at at the time, but then read it again and fell in love with um, um, the producer of uh, Val Luton. Yeah, just sort of like bong, and then I went on like like a month, <laughs> uh, a year long Val Luton kick, and watched everything I could by him. Yeah, yeah, no, that was uh, yeah, yeah. It's like well, the whole thing and the the thing about like movies like well, like Curse of the Demon, and I believe it was Eternal Youth we're talking about, right? Right, right. Um, yeah, the thing about a lot of the references that I would give like live action stuff is mainly that with no budget, what some directors, and I think that was Trevernier. Um, yeah. Yeah. It was the yeah. French guy. Yeah. It was like what they would do with almost nothing right. is amazing. You know? Well, that like was Kurt... the, the trip with film noir, classic film noir yeah. is like, you could like do shit on the cheap, do stuff on the cheap. And um, <laughs> and um, sorry, Luke. cover it, cover it, and keep it not not put any light on it. So yeah. it, it was very instructive for how to pick out the important details with light and leave everything else in the shadow. Yeah, which was also um, a, a big um, touch point for us. Yeah, and which was unfortunate in this one. It's like it was essential to the script that everything is in daytime. And, uh, you know, I couldn't, uh, you know, I couldn't get Marty to change that. You know, it's like, it was like, no, no, it's important that he starts out the day just like he did in the day where he's going to work and blah, blah, blah. Okay, whatever. It's like, it's like, it's all daytime. And then at the very mm -hmm. end, finally, it's night. But w the clock tower could have easily been, but it's supposed to be three. You know, it's got to be three. It can't be three in the morning. So it's got to be three in the afternoon. You know, that's essential because, you know, he's going to be killed at exactly 3.15. And I'm like, got it. Got it. If only he went to night court. <laughs> <laughs> then we could have changed it. But then you wouldn't have had the three, which was like perfect for, you know, the trap for, you know, Hill to be on that. So that when he hits 3.15, he's squished, mm -hmm. you right. know. Yeah. So it had to be three. It had to be that three. It's like otherwise it couldn't. Have, it could have been nine o'clock at night, mm, kind of. But it wouldn't work because the minute hands go in the it wrong. It would have way. had to be eight forty-five, and then he had to have had been tied up on the bottom, hanging to yeah. the bottom. Of it. See, yeah, nothing works except yeah. for three. <laughs> so Marty Pasco was correct on that one. Well, and also <laughs> it it was like. Uh, referenced um castle cagliostro and that stuff with yes you know the the evil guy and the princess and lupin on the clock hands yeah that was a direct yeah. reference swiping i whatever you want to call it <laughs> i wouldn't say Taste for homage. yeah <laughs> but that was that, that was definitely part of the script right there you yeah. know and it was obvious that david weiss had seen castle cagliostro and <laughs> This is like his one chance to actually get inside that clock tower and have fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, I was looking at the storyboards earlier, and the I think the episode had a different title earlier on, didn't it? It was uh, it was labelled as "Time, See What's Become of Me," which I thought that's, that's quite a yeah a lengthy that's title. A, that's a that's a uh, Marty Pasco thing. Oh, I don't <laughs> I don't think I don't think that was yeah it was like his story editor that's the kind of stuff he would uh, do it's like it strikes me as being his sort of thing but then Bruce would go no too many words <laughs> clock king <laughs> it's like yeah it's very it's like, on the it's nose. an introduction of the character yeah like uh cat in the claw part 1 and 2 for instance mm -hmm. I really thought that it should have been the first one it should have yes it's a two-parter but i thought that my episode 
the first one should have just been Catwoman. You know? Because, yeah, there's a plot, the cat and the claw, and it's like, you know, red claws in there and all that. But it's the first time you see Catwoman, and I think just the title of the the, the character would be important. And it's like, kind of like that. that's why it works here, you know? Mm-hmm. There are some characters like Rachel Ghoul and stuff where you don't do that. But um, these iconic characters, you know. So Clock King is actually a better title for this than the whole rambling thing. Mm-hmm. And then, of course, the yeah. next one is Time Out of Joint. Which is got a really much better animation job than we got on this one. But the whole concept of time travel or time freezing time and stuff is like jesus where did that that is a rather advanced technology for temple fugit to have harnessed i mean i didn't know he was that much of a scientist (laughs) i'd have to watch that episode again but i was but i was very jealous about how good the animation was yeah i mean by that point in the series i think you'd kind of figured out which studios were the ones to use and which ones were ones to drop (laughs) <laughs> yeah, well, they actually hung on to too many of the bad ones. Oh, really? And to, well, and to be com- curious to, to know how much choice they had in the matter, really. I mean, they had to use who was available. Um, well, yeah, exactly. It's like um, there was a big to-do about ACOM. But at that time, Warner Brothers needed ACOM. They, they needed that extra studio. And they needed Sunrise. And the only thing that made me angry about Sunrise was Sunrise is a very capable, one of the best animation studios. Mm. They they would do like these wonderful things like Crusher Joe and Gegino Gitaro, you know, gr- great, great animation stuff, great features, really good TV stuff. They also did, I think, Dirty Pair, you know, so totally capable, good studio. But what happened with us, like when we got, you know, I noticed this, it started out on Cat in the Claw, where it was obvious that it was farmed out. And Sunrise, I forget the name of the guy that um, was, you know, was our connection in Japan. He was kind of the agent working for Sunrise. But he's like, no, no, we're doing it all ourselves right here in town, you know. And I'm like, no, you're not. You're farming it out somewhere. I don't know where. So the communication, it's like if I could have communicated directly with that studio. And it ended up being Jade in China. Mm. And the reason why I knew it was that Jade, the president and, you know, production head, translators and stuff came and they made a point of visiting uh warner brothers so i met them you know and the thing is this show like this particular episode was jade going to the wall they were doing their absolute absolute best it's the best they could do um, they really wanted to get into action adventure and they really wanted to do this stuff. So they were giving it their all. They just didn't have the equipment, didn't have the cameras and, and just didn't have the ability to, uh, be as good as, you know, say TMS. Well, I'm curious so, cause go ahead. I'm sorry. No, it's, they, they were, they were doing their absolute best and they didn't have multiplane cameras. So there's so many shots that are calling for multiplane and they're indicated to be multiplane with shifts and stuff and perspective. And they just didn't have it. They, I mean, they don't have those cameras. Now, if it was TMS and TMS would farm it out, TMS would handle those scenes internally where most of the animation is being done out of house they would actually you know supplement that and actually do what was indicated in the sheets and in the in the layouts and in the the storyboard whereas even translation i think for jade was difficult you know 
because the language that you use in animation, especially when you're writing down, you're doing indications and you're sending it to a Japanese studio, doesn't necessarily translate into Chinese. Mm -hmm. They may not even have terms, the same terms, you know. So th these guys, they, they did their best. They did their best. And I, so at the end of the day, I can't complain about the work they did. But uh, it's, it's probably the first time that they'd ever done like uh, human figure kind of cartoons. They probably mm -hmm. only, had only ever done like goofy, uh, very cartoonish kind of stuff. So this was kind of a leap for them. And uh, I think they've gotten better since this. This was like the very beginning of their studio actually doing that stuff. And I don't I don't really know where they are right now. But like the whole Chinese uh, animation industry has gotten better, you know, with, you know, the advancing of technology and stuff. But at this time, this was still cells, you know, one, laying one on top of the other. And if uh, I knew that it was, if I knew the limitations of Sunrise at this point, I did know. So the storyboards had to be very clever. And we're dancing around the fact that I can't use more than three layers of acetate because I know it's going to create cell dirt. Mm. And these guys don't have the ability, if I call a retake on a shot, they really didn't have the ability to get rid of the cell dirt. So the more times they would go back and revisit and shoot it again, more dirt's going to end up on the cells. And if you have more than three layers, that gets, you know, that, that, that gets really difficult. So you had, had to really, on a very complicated episode full of crowds and full of, you know, elaborate locations like this one, um, it was kind of a brain bender to try and figure out how, how to minimize the problems that are, I knew were going to happen once the footage came back. So at the same time we were doing this, um, the Batman animated, Marvel was gearing up to doing the X-Men. Right. And I'm curious about who they used for their animation. I mean, I must confess, I've never actually watched an episode of their <laughs> of that series. Well, well I mean, I... I, I I'll tell you right now, I've only watched Batman. For the most part, I've only watched Batman episodes that I've worked on. You know, oh. I, you know, I haven't watched most of the other episodes from the yeah. first season. I didn't watch any of Batman Beyond. I haven't watched any of the um, revamp that started in 97. I only watched Justice League because Chris Rutowski said, you have to watch this and gave me the box set. <laughs> um, I'm kind of a, I don't know if you call it snobbishness or laziness, laziness or what. Um, um, Both. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Lazy snob. Lazy snob. <laughs> um, yeah, so no. I'm, I, now I'm thinking maybe I should go back and watch some of those X-Men just to see how they, how, um, how they did, how they did. Marvel was, mm. uh, that was uh, Lee Gunther. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it was Cuckoo's Nest. He, uh, Gunther had like the Taiwan connection. So if you look at that animation, don't worry, you'll be disappointed. Okay. Yeah. They used ACOM for their premiere episode. And uh, yeah. I, I read previously on X Men, which is a book about the making of X Men, the animated series. And when they turned in their first cut, it was so bad, it delayed the premiere by three months. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Well, no. But that was that was Gunther, uh, Lee Gunther. That those those were his friends and connections, you know. Mm -hmm. Whereas mm -hmm. our connections came from the Deke days, where Acom was kind of, oh no, do we have to use these guys again, you know? But our main connections were uh, the, basically was the TMS connection, because mm -hmm. you know the good episodes of Alf and Alf Tales, um, right. and then and even even Starcom. It was uh, those were all through uh, Ken Dur and uh, you know Fukuda. 
came so did on those board connections translate to like the Sony stuff? Because I remember watching a couple of the Men in Black episodes I worked on and was like stunned at how good the animation was. Yeah, that's entirely possible. I don't know. I wasn't there. Yeah. But uh, yeah, some well, Sony, Sony, you know, they have a Japanese connection anyway. Right. Because I would say that, um, uh, yeah, well, it's like when I worked for Sony on a Spectacular Spider-Man, um, they got some working, I'm not going to name the names, but there was some of the studios that were in Japan. Like, it's kind of like what I was talking about with Sunrise. I've worked with them since, the same studios that Sony was working with. And the work that they did for us on Spectacular Spider-Man was quite good. Same studio. And then I've worked with them on other shows, and it's wretched. You know? Mm. So Sony, I think, had that connection, you know, where they're they're going to get the premier people. The good people are going to work for them. Whereas, you know, other studios that I've worked with and used the same Japanese studio... They obviously just farmed it out somewhere, you know, mm. don't yeah. check it, don't care, you know, yeah, yeah, big deal. <laughs> Again, I won't name the shows. <laughs> because <laughs> I'm go on your IMDB and start accusing them. <laughs> yeah, it's, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Anyhow, but it's, it's just for people to know, it's like, especially back in, back in when this show was made, you know, in the 90s, early 90s. You know, it was, it was it was a bit of a different world, and as a director, you really got you you got a lot going on that you have to deal with inside your head, and it's like some gigantic uh, jigsaw puzzle. You know, not I wouldn't say no. It's not like a jigsaw puzzle. I would go and say that you know the final product is a painting, you know, that you put on display, <laughs> and. All of the elements, like what brushes are you going to use? What kind of paint are you going to use? What colors are you going to use? Mixed media are you going to do this. You're going to do that. It's like it's almost like you have to look at like a the cartoon as being that kind of a thing. Except that the elements I have are the studios that we're going to use, the artists that I've got, you know, and and where to put this part and how to break up the script and you know and how 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 does this how's this script going to work? Because if you you look at this. If you look at this story, this one's a difficult one. <laughs> mm. You know, how, how do you huh. get the clock king? It's like, how, how do you get the clock king to work? You know, there's nothing special about him. How do you make it convincing that he's given Batman a hard time? But the thing is, is Temple Few gets so smart. Like, you, you know, it's in the vault. Batman almost does what he shouldn't be doing. Don't touch that box, Batman, in Temple Fu. Oh, in case you're thinking of touching the box, you know, he tells him. So, you know, that and it's it's in it and it just like in it and it's an interesting thing about this character that they're what instead of just eliminating Batman, which he could have, he tells him, you know, so there's hubris, which is actually mm -hmm. his downfall. You know, yeah, it's almost a challenge to Batman. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, well, that's one of the reasons I avoided directing for so long because I could see that um, multitasking becomes a way of life, and uh, I wasn't real big on multitask. I avoided that. I didn't find it <laughs> attractive. <laughs> yeah. And my, I just have a, my dyslexic brain. It's the kind of thing that I actually found a talent that I could actually do. Right. <laughs> and I don't know why I'm still that way. Yeah. All right. Well, this has been a fascinating conversation. Any final thoughts on Clock King before I wrap this up? Um, I, I just, I just want to say that it's like, I really enjoyed these kinds of characters they're kind of out of out of the norm and mm -hmm. clock king was always there were so many different versions of him in the uh dc universe and i think this is the best one by far 
Oh, yeah. You know, I, I just think the idea, and it, it was kind of the same way with uh, um, in Batman, the animated series, especially the first seasons, is like how they, when we would break from the DC universe normal, Mm -hmm. Like, this is the best Clock King. No one really could figure out how to make the idea of the Clock King work. You know, he's a guy with a clock head. You know, he's got a big clock face. And I remember having the discussions with Bruce, you know, about how he's going to look. And uh, just the fact that he just has... The only difference is he's got the glasses now. <laughs> yeah. You know? It's the only difference. And it, and it, and, it, and it's it actually creates a very intriguing character, you know, just the fact that there is so little um, of the supernatural, whatever you want to call it, about him. He's just so normal looking that it's like that actually creates like a much more interesting, intriguing character. Well, one of my um, my my favorite period of Batman for me, the Golden Age of Batman, is from like 1969 to 1974 when yeah. he rarely fought the costume villains i mean because yeah. they, they, as they say the golden age of comics is 12 you know and that was you know one of my late late you know in my adolescent years but i mean i really don't like well, i preferred that he'd have 15 pages to solve a crime to be a detective and you know get a new cast of pretty much regular people with every new story you know and every issue of batman mm -hmm. detective um and um in a way that this episode the clock king is is close to that it, well you know actually that you're saying that batman and batman enemy is my what is second to like neil adams version from that period my favorite version of batman because he's well the other thing that struck me at the time was like you got like batman getting all angsty you know and chest beating yeah. and all this neurotic stuff whereas during my period and in the batman animated he's the adult in the room right you know and he has his dark places but he's gotten control of them yeah, um, and I, I I prefer that version of Batman. That's the version of Batman that I like. Yeah, I agree. No, that that that, that is uh, that's essentially why this. Well, it's why Kevin Conroy is so good, right? You know, yeah. the character that he created. That's the best Batman. Mm -hmm. And when I see the movies, I've said it before. I'll say it again. When I look at the movies, I just go. Why is that guy even Batman? Why does he care? He's so mean-spirited, you know? Oh, the dark angst. And I do appreciate the Dark Knight Returns, you know, Miller's... Uh, but that isn't how the character has to be. Like, you know, that story is like, it's a later age Batman. He's been through a lot. He hasn't been Batman for a long time. It's It's... I don't think Miller um, created the Dark Knight Returns. It's it's a mini series. It's its own thing. Well, that's it's supposed to be the template for every yeah, other Batman thereafter. It's not, it, and that is all anyone grafts nowadays. Batman's yeah. not not a mean creep. He's not a creepy guy. It's like it's good for that one storyline, you know, and it's unique. But it should be unique. It's also the same way I feel about Batgirl. You know, okay, Alan Moore wrote a horror story, The Killing Joke, in which Barbara Gordon is wounded. Why? She didn't have to become Oracle. She could have recovered and been gone on being Batgirl and becoming Batwoman or whatever. You know, it's just <laughs> like everybody's like, oh, you know, that, that if something like hits a hits a note, you know, and actually gets a lot of attention paid to it, all of a sudden everyone has to jump onto that bandwagon, you know, and make it canon yeah. of, the, of the series. 
and it's really not necessary. I mean, a lot of these things could just be, you know, stand alone and just be their own thing. You know? Yeah. Like, I like, like, for instance, I like the fact that the Clock King that shows up in the Harley Quinn series right now, mm -hmm. it's for laughs, and it's great. And they don't swipe this. They don't insist on this character, you know? They just have their own. And I think that's great, you know? But you're like everything yeah. everything about that series is its own thing. You know? And and it's it's like the Harley in that series and the Ivy in that series isn't necessarily the Harley or the Ivy that's gonna be in any other Batman show. You know. That's that's yeah. one thing I like about it. It's it's its own thing. And Batman the animated series, this is its own thing. Yeah, yeah, although there are elements of BTAS being brought into the comics now. I guess it's because the writers grew up with BTAS and love it so much and want to integrate as much of it as they can. Like the the Clock King, the Temple Fugit Clock King, he's in the yeah. comics now. He's a new member of the Suicide Squad. Yeah. Um, How does that work? <laughs> I haven't uh, well, <laughs> there was a good episode of Justice League where he was like their planner for um, raiding the Watchtower. And I thought that was ah. really cool. And if they do the same thing... Yeah. That would be great. But if he's out there on the front lines, mm, I don't know. I think he needs a unicycle. <laughs> <laughs> that I looks like know. a pocket watch. Yeah. <laughs> Just going down the street. <laughs> going down the street, spinning a pocket watch, riding a unicycle with a bumper shoot under his under one arm. <laughs> I'm gonna draw that. <laughs> Yeah, you'd better. I want to see that on Facebook, by the way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> right. Okay. Any uh, final thoughts from yourself, Brad? I mean, I assume you enjoyed working on um, this episode. Sounds like it. Oh, I just, you know, I, 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 I would, you know, wondered last night as I was watching um, Clock King and Joker's Favor, what anybody who'd never seen this back in the day would think about watching them now. You know what would the what would oh. the judgment be? Oh um, no, it's like the Brad. It's like if, if well, when I go to conventions, yeah, but those are all people who grew up with it. No, you know we're getting no, no. I'm going to conventions, and uh, since it's been on HBO Max, the generation that's coming up, Batman the animated series is their favorite cartoon. And I've had, like, a, well, when I was at the Garden State uh, Comic Con, Morristown, New Jersey, right, right when, yeah, it's two years ago, this uh, 16 or 17-year-old girl comes up to me and says, oh, I, can't, I just wanted to meet you. You're my absolute favorite director. And I'm like, <laughs> how can I be your favorite director? You're, you know, you're, you're a child. And it's like, but it's because for the very first time, she's seeing Batman, the animated series. Okay. And they don't question that. Where's the cell phones? You know, none right. of them. They, they accept the world that this is in, which is an alternate universe, you know, where there's still forties technology. There's, there are laptops, all of that. And they don't question it. It's like it's there's a whole new generation and this stands up. Uh, and they it's not because they're buying DVDs and stuff. They don't have those. They're watching HBO Max and they're, or they're streaming it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, no, they, it, it, they respond. They respond to it. Like if, if you go on to YouTube, Brad, there are people that like groups of people who are watching will get together and film themselves watching Batman for the first time. Hmm. And their, re their reactions are, uh, are pretty good. You know, the, the, some of them are goofy doofus guys. And then there are other ones where they'll, you know, they're actually a group of people who don't have any idea at all about Batman, the animated series. They're just watching it because they've been told to watch it. Hmm. And it's pretty interesting seeing their reactions. Okay. One girl reacting to um, 
Two Face Part One. I was like, um, it was I watched it, you know, and and the thing is how she gets it, you know, and she understands it, and it's like she she was obviously obviously someone who's on has depression or whatever, which many people have, you know. I have it, but I'm not medicated for it, you know, because for whatever. But she totally got the character. And the reaction that people have, like when they don't know how Two-Face became Two-Face, how that happened. And when he gets blasted and ragdolled, they're all like, oh, you know. No one says anything. They're all me, 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 because there's a big fight happening. And then all of a sudden, bam! And it's like, you know, mm. very honest reactions. And if you got to remember, the animation on Batman the Animated Series, even when I complain about this, you know, sunrise and, well, you know, you've heard me complain. They, the animation on Batman the Animated Series is heads and tails above what they're used to you know and there is that charm of the 2d animation that is new to most of these people now of course warner brothers has the problem that hbo max isn't interested in the shitty cartoons that they've been churning out you know all the directed videos they're pretty crappy in my opinion you know even the animation on the Harley Quinn show is pretty bad. But the storyboards, the idea, the scripts, and just how fucking funny it is carries the whole show, you know, and mm -hmm. I've said it before. The extreme violence, like I worked on the, I don't know, Luke, have you seen the Valentine's Day special? Oh, my God. It's like if that had fine animation, I don't think you could watch it. I mean, Bane, Bane humping buildings, it's kind of important that it's hump, 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 and the thing just collapses. If it's realistic, you know, how many people are being maimed and destroyed, you know? I mean, at the end, when, like, Harley and Ivy are having their loving moment after all this stuff is happening, and, and in the background, I actually drew this, there's Gotham burning, <laughs> you know? If it looked like an actual nuclear disaster, it wouldn't be funny. But if it, it being the kind of crude animation that it is, you know, works in its favor. So you actually can laugh at it. Okay. Yeah, anyhow. I agree. That's anyway, yes, the kids get it, Brad. Great. Okay. You know, so don't count them out. Well, I, I I think about like having come to the um, works of Val Luton in the early '90s when he'd been dead for well, or he, you know, the, the, those movies were 50 years old. Of course, it's I don't know, it's different because I was key. I no, I I don't particularly like watching. Ah. <laughs> what? No, oh, it's it's too hard. To, see, it's too hard to articulate. Well, it's the thing is, is like growing up for me when I was growing up, it's the same thing, right? It's like I was weaned on Johnny Quest mm -hmm. and stuff like that, and I had the fortune of Disney films were regularly regularly re released, mm -hmm. so I was exposed to Snow White mm -hmm. at an early age and Pinocchio at an early mm -hmm. age and uh you know so and and of course on television all of the warner brothers cartoons mm -hmm. you know so that was that was what i was looking for and the, the popeyes and all that the, the fleischers um but i still loved passionately loved astro boy you know Almost no animation at all. It's just, just like simple, simple, simple animation. And yet I loved it. Right. And I loved Kimba the White Lion too. Mm -hmm. So it's like, there's just degrees of, if it's good, mm -hmm. you know, and Tezuka and even, you know, early Miyazaki, all that, you know, like Conan Boy of the Future, which I, I'm not talking about that as like, but 
And then when I would go and people would say, oh, kids aren't interested in black and white films. I loved black and white films right? as a kid. Right. And there was like ones like ones that I like zeroed in on that I'd like Hitchcock. Mm -hmm. I loved Hitchcock when I was a kid. Yep. You know, and people were like, oh, it's not that old fashioned stuff. Right. You know, that's what most of the kids at school would treat it like. I'm like, you know, then the first time I saw King Kong, you know, I nearly crapped my pants. Right. It was so good. You know, yep. and I, well, and, you know, so I, I, I have, there's just as many nerds and geeks and weirdos nowadays in this generation coming up, like in Luke's generation, like he's unique. Look at him, you know? know. Yeah. It's like, how come, <laughs> how come Luke can put together those animatics, you know? Just all you do is hand him over the storyboard. It's like, well, it's like, he's just got that brain. There's right. just going to be, yeah. there's always going to be that, the amount of people who get it. Right. And we, and we are the ones who are going to run the world. <laughs> right. Well, yeah. I, I remember, I remember when um, I got into animation back in like 1980, I, I, I started working professionally back in 1983. I hadn't watched any animation until my, since 1972, which is basically around the time I discovered comic books when I was 12. And um, my attitude was, well, of course, television animation sucks. How could it possibly be anything else? <laughs> and uh, and it was actually meeting you and Dan Reba and uh, Richard Reynas at Deke and seeing Japanese animation, their TV animation, which, you know, like the guy, who's the guy with the eyeball on his shoulder, you know? Gigo no Gitaro. Gitaro. Almost no, anim like you say, almost no animation, but it's really fun. And that was the thing that gave me hope that maybe the only thing we have to worry about isn't, isn't our low animation budgets. It's getting the freedom to do that. Yeah. Um, you know, and not have to worry about standards and practices or um clueless producers and the, the question yeah. would be getting the freedom and the space to do that and it's sort of like um the stuff we did at dic was um a warm-up and a heartening uh forerunner of what we were able to do on batman yeah it's just sort of like batman was sort of like okay this is it maybe this is finally it and it is and it isn't well, not done life yet. Goes on. That was like thirty years ago. Yeah. So, not done yet. Okay. Well, <laughs> God yeah. knows what the future holds. God knows. Yeah. yeah, that's why I'm not. That's why I have. Uh, that's why I'm so unpopular with so many of the studi studios. Is because I still bring that attitude. You know. Mm -hmm. Got to push. Don't accept mediocre. Because if you if you you have mediocre, and you and you work and and do what we do, you come up with eh, pretty good. At least it's pretty good, you know. Yeah. You can over you can overcome shittiness. Yeah, yeah well, anyway. it's, it's that attitude that leads to women crying on YouTube about your episodes, Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one of them <laughs> one of them one of the best reactions i've ever gotten was got a, I, it, it's it's one of these groups of people you know and it's like you know group mm -hmm. of millennials um i don't know would they be millennials or younger anyway and there's only one girl in the group you know and they they're fans of the games and all that stuff you know mm -hmm. Um, but it's the first time they were watching on Leather Wings. <laughs> and the transformation happens, and they're like, whoa, and the guys are, you know, talking, you know, oh, you know, they're, they're all freaking out over it. And the girl, whose name I don't remember, it's like, you'd have to watch, but she had the best reaction. Like, just when Man Bat jumps on top of Batman, he's on top of the desk, the overturned desk, and he's got Batman, and he's like, huh. And then Kurt 
from the doorway and he looks over at his wife you know and he has that cringe reaction like yeah. don't don't look at me and she goes oh he's a good boy <laughs> <laughs> it's like you know that's came out of her you know it's like he's not he's not he's a good boy he's, he's ashamed of himself you know it's like that that i thought was like a good reaction to that yeah that's great so, so they're they're worth your time and it's like and, and i'm just saying young people get it brad yeah they, they do. do they do get it and they love the they love it it's like seeing it for the first time and like uh, a lot of these people the same groups of people like when they watch mask of the phantasm it's interesting to watch the group reaction because i knew the answer you know when we're storyboarding mask of the phantasm i'm going i don't know if this is like any kind of a mystery that's gonna but very few people figure out that it's andrea beaumont very few people figure it out. It, the, the mystery actually works until right. the Joker, until the Joker actually says, you know, hey, lady, you're hard, harder to kill a uh, cockroach on steroids. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you figured it out. You know, when that happens, it's like most people are like, oh, it is. It's her. You know, they don't know. Okay. So it's it's it was it's worth watching hmm. so what do i do if i want to watch one of those what do i search just um like if you're looking for like any of the ones that luke does uh, on um youtube okay you know it's just type in you know group reaction to batman the animated series okay. on youtube and there'll be stuff Okay. Yeah, it's worth it's worth it's worth checking out. Yeah. Well, one of my and, one of my key key experiences was um, screen doing screening out Mask of the Phantasm with a matinee audience in Hollywood once. And when when it was in its original release, so that was yeah. really. I, I wish I'd been able to do that more. Yeah. Well, when I went to see Mask of the Phantasm when I was working. At on uh, stretch armstrong at hasbro um was it sophia and you know she she was a you know she was a you know anime fangirl and and avian they were gonna go and see uh a screening of mass of the phantasm and lauren hmm. uh, and lauren was also she's a big real ghostbusters fan too but she uh you know, they said, yeah, it's going to be screening over here in North Hollywood at the Landmark. And I'm like, oh, yeah, okay. He says, Do you want to go? Come on, let's go. You know, it's like, okay, I'll go. Barely got into the theater. Mm. Packed. Wow. Packed. And it wasn't like this was like a big uh, advertised thing. It's like a one-night screening of Mask of the Phantasm. Mm. And you couldn't, you couldn't you couldn't fit an extra person in there and they had like three or four shows mm. and uh they were just you know people lined up around the block i barely got in you know sold out interesting so, yeah so yeah it's it's bigger than you think okay